Uh, so, welcome once more. Uh, this is our sixth lecture. Uh, and of course, there will be practice. And depending on how quickly we go through the lecture, we may decide, if you agree, to uh, finish a bit earlier. So, if there's time to finish earlier, I think that maybe we cannot make a break, but we uh, simply finish earlier. So, um, very briefly, before we dive into the new topic, which is borrowing, a summary of what we did. So last week, we talked about analogy. Analogical change is what's, you know, driven by analogy. And if you remember, we said it was a process where one form in language adjusts to resemble another form, which, with which it is related through meaning or, again, form. For neogrammarians, analogy was everything that was not sound change or borrowing. And uh, some people claim that analogy is actually kind of internal borrowing because a language borrows, in a way, its own patterns to create uh, the same pattern in positions where this pattern did not originally exist. So analogy, as we defined it, is based on proportional analogy. If, for example, a ride road, if a ride is similar to road, and then I have the, uh, or drive is to drove, then uh, dive should be dove, right? Uh, dive dove or ride road or mm, something like that. So this proportional analogy is not conditioned by phonological factors. It usually depends on morphology. And in other words, analogy reduces the alterations that, create, that were created by phonology. So in other words, it's a paradox. Sound change is regular, but it creates irregular forms, exceptions. But then analogy happens irregularly. You cannot predict it accurately when it's going to happen, but it creates a nice system with no exceptions. It eliminates alterations by sound changes, and these are the two forces in language. So analogy uh, is typically that one that which creates a neat system with no exceptions. That's called analogical leveling. But very rarely, well, actually not that rarely, but uh, in fewer instances than leveling, you have also an analogical extension. That's, for example, when an irregular verb becomes um, still irregular, but changes the class so that it's, you know, behaving like a bigger group of irregular verbs, or rarely when the regular verb becomes irregular. So that's extension, when you extend alteration to bigger number of forms. And then we wrapped up by saying that analogy, although it's like the one of two main forces in language, so innovation through sound changes is opposed by analogy, which reduces those alterations. Analogy, this principle of if A equals B, then C should equal X, also extends to many other things that we don't necessarily think of as analogy. Hypercorrection, when you correct what is already correct. Folk etymology, which gives you hamburgers. Uh, back formation, where you actually take something and reanalyze it. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, peas. Actually, you know, we, we think that P was the singular form, but it was already uh, singular there, so there was no need for S. Meta-analysis with an adder, nadere, which became an adder, so we create new kind of analysis based on pronunciation, nether with an article, an, an, an adder was really analyzed from meta-analysis as an adder. So original adder was nether, but we got a new form adder because we thought that a, n was actually the article. And blending, according to Campbell, is also, hyper, uh, also analogy, but it's most people don't agree with Campbell. 
And we also said that immediate analogical model is what usually happens, that analogy happens in words that frequently occur together. You remember the examples with January and February, also male and female. These are typical contexts, five and four, uh, the example that you also had in the lecture. And the non-immediate model is in the same paradigm. And this happened, for example, with English irregular comparisons uh, of adjectives, where we created a new system that was regular, but the old forms like next became separate words. So nigh, near, next uh, became near, near, nearest. So that's the summary. And now, as I always do, I uh, prepared some examples from final exam. So from April, four years ago, explain why the verb dive, Old English divan, past tense divde, has two alternative forms for the past tense, dived and dove. So what would you say? Anybody? Feel free to unmute yourself. What would be the key word to write here? Analogy. Yes. So just a couple of points. I mean, this gives you a total of 10 points. Each test gives you a total of 10 points. But you will get a couple of points just for even if you get it wrong afterwards, if you just write that this is an example of analogical change or this is an example of an analogy, you already have at least three points, let's say. Uh, depends, you know, I'm sometimes, I judge how many points to war based on what follows. But if you just write this is an example of analogy, I will probably give you two or three points, even if you don't write anything else. But then the question is, you know, why? So you could say that uh, based on this old English div and past tense divde, what you can actually decide, determine there is that this was originally a regular verb. So dived is the, the original form. It was a regular verb. So it was not an irregular verb. So this cannot be analogical leveling, right? Because analogical leveling, if we let it loose, will create all verbs which are regular. So this is the opposite one. This is analogical extension. So you would say that um, this is an example of analogy, in particular an example of analogical extension, because the regular verb div and divde from Old English became irregular based on the analogy with verbs such as, and now you have to be creating, but what, what would be, for example, a good example for, you know, dive becoming dove? Where, where war? Where war, yeah, probably, yeah, perfect, where war. Uh, and you say, in, 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 uh, with analogy, uh, like, with verbs like where war, that would be okay. Uh, and that would be full point. You see, you don't have to write a lot, but you just have to mention the key terms and fill in the gaps which you can, you know, fill in logically. So uh, another uh, analogy here could be uh, drive drove as well. Uh, so whichever you choose that follow that sounds analogical is probably okay because we never know exactly what happened that's the problem with analogy so uh you have to write it's an analogical change uh analogical extension where the regular verb became irregular creating new alterations or extending the alteration where it was not originally and this happened probably in analogy with verbs such as where war or drive drove which gave you dive dove instead of dived. Uh, great. So that's, for example, 10 points. Then from that same term, that's April 2016, uh, the sixth question was explain why the adjective old has two forms for the comparative and superlative, elder eldest and older oldest. Again, what would be the key thing to mention? 
analogical change or analogy, but which one now would you mention for those extra points leading up to 10 so that you don't get the leveling? Same? Yes. Because it creates regularity. Exactly. So with this, you are already above five or six points. So with just two sentences where you explain it, you can get full points, 10. So you would say this is an example of an logical change, or this is an example of an analogy. In particular, this is a change. This is an example of an logical leveling, where the morphological uh, patterns or paradigms become uniform. So the original. Then you would say in old English, old elder eldest was a regular pattern caused by e mutation. But in Middle English, this was no longer regular. So uh, through analogical leveling, regular forms older and oldest were created, while elder and eldest were retained in a specialized meaning. And that's 10 points. As simple as that, you have it in the slides from last week. And we actually discussed this example in the lecture, so you can play it back on YouTube. Uh, finally, uh, sometimes instead of typical analogical change, you can have questions that deal with those, uh, let's say, other forms of analogical change, like, uh, let's say, folk etymology, back formation, meta analysis. But I will never give you blending because it's controversial whether it's actually analogy. So this year, before Corona came to Serbia in February 2020, uh, this was the question. What is the seventh one? So sometimes you can get up to two or even three questions dealing with analogy because it's so important. So expect up to three questions about analogy. What is hypercorrection? Provide two examples and explain how they work. Sorry, I put a comma at the end. But what would you say? Anybody, do you remember? There was a cool example from uh, Western dialects of the United States. Uh, it's a socially induced change where uh -huh. we have a correct, where we have a, a pattern of correcting things which uh, don't have to be corrected but are actually already correct. And we have uh, the san, fine, instead of the at the end. Yeah, exactly. So already you get uh, yeah, more than six points. Now, another example would be you and I uh, in the accusative position instead of you and me. That's, again, hypercorrection, again, which I mentioned last week. But you can also mention something else that you think of also in Serbian or, you know, if you speak Hungarian, I will expect, I will also accept Hungarian if you provide translation and explanation in English or Slovak, whatever language you can come up with. This is historical linguistics, so generally we accept English, but everything else is OK. So uh, you get four points for just explaining what it is, and then three points for each of those two examples. So one can be this, you know, San becoming, uh, of course, uh, you know, sand is OK when they return the, but pond shop and similar expressions are not okay because they add the everywhere because they thought that they should return the in the position uh, in at the end of the word and that's again 10 points so as you can see just on the basis of last week's lecture and the slides from last week's lecture which are in google drive uh also on the website you can score up to 30%. So together with the previous topics, you are now well above 70% theoretically, depending on the examination period, 60 to 70% of the final exam is already covered. Uh, after today's lecture, it, we will get to, let's say, 70 or 80% covered that's uh borrowing this is actually the beginning of proper lecture 20 minutes after the beginning of the stream but hey uh you know uh, i think it was important to show the exam 
So today we'll talk about borrowing. And as you know, from our department, there are many people who deal with borrowing. Uh, in Serbia, it's a hot topic still to this day, although it started more than 30 years ago. So many people will say that borrowing rules, that it's one of the really interesting topic. It's fundamental a topic about language contact. So it's uh, really constantly interesting because the dynamics of language contact are constantly changing and different words and structures get borrowed. So um, in the very introduction to this topic, I don't want to bore you because you know this from other courses, it is quite common that one language would take words from another language. This has been happening since there were languages, separate languages. The most important thing is, uh, since we are dealing with historical linguistics, that you don't have focus on words themselves, because borrowing is much bigger than words. Of course, there are words, but any form of linguistic material can be borrowed. Sounds, phonological rules, grammatical morphing, syntactic patterns, semantic associations, discourse strategies. I'm pretty sure that Professor Perchic tell, told you about, you know, uh, shopping assistants uh, who now tell you kako mogu da vam pomogne. That's simply unimaginable for somebody who's like, you know, like my mom, she, she's, uh, she was born in 1942. She tells me that she would always expect shopping, you know, people working at shops to ask you, Izvolite, šta biste želeli, šta vas zanima, not kako mogu da pomogu. This is exactly, you know, the discourse strategy and the pattern also grammatical taken from English. So borrowing uh, at, at different levels. Uh, so, uh, this, of course, means that throughout time, all languages were in contact, and that means that we always had some form of bilingualism. People spoke more than one language. So, uh, without much further ado, uh, without, uh, you know, too many slides, because you know this from different courses at, at our department, uh, when you talk about loan words, the, uh, a loan word is a word which was borrowed from another language and which originally was not part of the vocabulary of the recipient language, but was taken. And the keyword here is adopted and adapted into this borrowing language uh, and becomes part of the this vocab vocabulary of the borrowing language the key point uh, for historical linguistics is why that happens so it's not restricted to serbian and anglicisms where we have stage instead of bina which ultimately is not a bad thing because bina is now for theater but stage is for concerts so it leads to stratification and specialization of lexis so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but the question is why that happens. So uh, based on your previous courses, can, do you know the three main reasons for borrowing? Well, Anybody? one could be because uh, the specific language didn't have a word for a concept. That's exactly, we call it the need. That's. That's, let's say, what, what again, we have to mention because Professor Pritchard, because he's the main authority on borrowings into, from English into Serbian, that's what he calls justified borrowing, when there's a need. Okay, anything else? To well, sound fancy. That to sound fancy, okay, we cannot call it that, but you're absolutely right. We call it prestige. Uh -huh. Yes, we call it, that reason is called prestige, because uh, we associate the language with the prestigious culture. So the fact that you use English term makes you sound prestigious in a way. But that's not new. Uh, English pork and pig 
and you know all these fancy terms for you know dishes unlike the animals that's example of that you know when you talked about dishes you wanted to sound fancy and you use french terms so you eat pork but if you're tending to the animal that gives you pork you're talking about the pig so this is this you know all the, these words for for meat types of meat as food are example of prestige and most french words were borrowed into english because of prestige not because of need always but there's a third reason can you guess there is a third reason because of the maybe uh new meaning Ah, but that's still, that still need that's still need there's a new meaning and then uh it's a subtype of of need uh there's something but i will get to it there's something called negative evaluation the opposite of prestige you take a word from a language that you hate or the you know the language of the people you hate and you give that word a negative association because you hate that those people so it's very nationalistic very politically incorrect but throughout history it happened and i'll show you some examples so uh now we already know so i will give you some um uh, you know some examples to uh actually support what we just discussed uh so the main reason for borrowing is need uh the need is uh you know simply uh a necessity uh so there's a new concept and you don't have a word for that new concept but it's a very important concept so you simply take uh, both the concept and the word into your own language uh, you simply need the word you need the word and uh, one of the most famous example described in details in campbell's book is an automobile the original uh, word for auto, right? We also did it, right? We took it as auto. So in Russian, it's automobile. In Finnish, it's the same as in Serbian, auto. In Swedish, and this is actually interesting how different languages borrow in Swedish, it's bill. Uh, that's, of course, the last part of automobile. Uh, other famous examples include coffee, Russian coffee, Finnish kahvi, yeah, Japanese kohli, uh, tobacco, which is in Finnish tobacco, Indonesian to, uh, tembuku, and this all comes from Arabic tabak through Spanish tobacco. The second reason that we analyzed and that we mentioned and identified very neatly is prestige. Most borrowings from English into Serbian according to some estimates are prestige some are need but most are prestige so the foreign term for some reason is considered highly esteemed these are like luxury loans and i already told you about pork uh, and uh, beef so generally even the word cuisine comes from french which simply means kitchen but it got this new prestigious meaning so the reason for that is the same reason why this is happening with english and serbian that french had a much higher social status and was much more prestigious than english during three almost 300 years of the norman french dominance in england uh, so english could have done perfectly well with only native terms for pig flesh or pig meat or cow flesh cow meat but the fact is that borrowing actually contrary to purist views expands the vocabulary so this is what we often forget with the examples such as stage and bina in serbian that very you uh, very commonly when we borrow something you, we can express more subtle differences so in this case prestige in a way overlaps with need it creates a richer vocabulary it allows you to express yourself in a more you know fine-tuned way so this is not necessarily bad that's the bottom line and the reason why english is the richest language in terms of vocabulary is actually because of borrowing 
you can have one and the same root borrowed in different historical periods and then you can get multiple subtle differences in meaning that you don't get anywhere else there are many other uh, examples uh, so for example uh, Votyak, a Finno-Ugric language borrowed from Tatar, which was a Turkic language, but was considered highly esteemed because the Tatars were ferocious, and even to this day they are considered ferocious, courageous, mighty warriors. So in case of Votyak, because of the high esteem of the Tatar community, they borrowed words which are not really the words which you normally borrow. So Votyak borrowed words for mother, father, grandmother, all key uh, words, uh, you know, in a language, simply because they wanted to be associated with the Tatar culture. That's another. That's a, an extreme example of borrowing for, for prestige. Uh, but if you think that this is the only case, the language which is so often mentioned in Campbell's book, Finnish, did the same. So Finnish borrowed words from uh, for mother, daughter, sister, bride, and many other words from Indo-European languages. So mother uh, in um, Old High German was uh, AD, and then I pay IT, so this is actually from Germanic languages. Uh, that's this IT form uh, that we have in Finnish is actually from Germanic because the Germans were more prestigious and more powerful for most of the history uh, of Finnish uh, communities. The same thing happened to daughter. It was borrowed from uh, Dukteris, uh, so from Baltic languages, and that became Titar. That's not the word which you have in Hungarian for uh, daughter. Uh, and the similar thing happened to sister. Again, it was taken from uh, Lithuanian. So it was uh, Ceser, uh, and then it became Cisar, like Cesar in Serbian. The same thing happened, uh, the same thing that happened with mother, daughter, sister happened for to bride and even to some bo uh, body parts. Uh, so not only female roles in the society, as you can see, that was for some reason considered to be prestigious from other languages. They took body parts from Indo-European languages like uh, tooth, for example, and neck. Uh, again, the most common words, uh, languages from which uh, Finnish was borrowing were surrounding languages, so Baltic and Germanic languages. And that brings us to this uh, third reason for borrowing. So it can be need, which is what Professor Pertich calls justified borrowings and justified anglicisms. Then not so justified, but still relevant for expansion of vocabulary, prestigious borrowings. And finally, uh, we, had, um, we have the third type, which is, of course, uh, what I uh, call negative evaluation. So this is the opposite of prestige. That's the adoption of the foreign word because um, you want to make it derogatory. So uh, one of the most famous examples comes from French. So uh, in French, I don't know how it's pronounced in uh, French, but uh, it's spelled as what you see here, H-A-B-L-E-R. Uh, let's guess that this is Able or something like that in French. I don't speak French. That word, if you speak Spanish, you can know immediately that it was borrowed from Spanish, where it simply means hablar. That tells, hablar probably, pronunciation. So there, uh, this tells you that French native speakers considered Spanish, you know, speakers, these macho people who are constantly brag and want to uh, get involved in romantic relationships. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, the most common example of negative evaluation. Another very famous uh, example from 
for negative evaluation comes from Finnish, uh, where the word koni means nag, old horse. It's uh, a word which, uh, with a very negative connotation. In Serbian, you would translate it as a raga, uh, like the worst horse you can imagine. Can you guess from which language it was borrowed? And can you guess the historical explanation for that? Finland? Uh, no, they don't border with Turkey. Think about who's to the to the to the east of Finland. Russian. A Russian. Yes, this is a Slavic word. Finland and Russia uh, are like Serbia and Croatia, let's say. They don't, you know, they don't like each other that much historically. Uh, and uh, Finnish people have some, you know, negatively associated encounters with Russia uh, through history. So uh, let's sum, sum it up as they don't like Russian and the Russian culture that much. So Kon. Uh, was the Russian word, and it was taken from, borrowed from Russian, where it is a normal, neutral term for a horse, like in Serbian, kon. But it was given negative connotation in the Finnish language because of the negative connotation of the Russian Empire and uh, the behavior of the Russian Empire towards Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, people. So that's an example of negative evaluation. You have many other examples. Uh, they're all listed in the presentation. So I will very quickly give you some of them. So for example, English assassin uh, comes from Arabic uh, assassin, which means hashish eaters. This is an 11th century Muslim sect who would intoxicate themselves with hashish or cannabis while they were preparing to kill someone of public standing. And this sect had the reputation that they would butcher the opponents uh, for simple violations of what they considered is the true Muslim uh, way. So uh, this is what gave um, the later sense of murder for hire or for phonetical reasons. So. Uh, this is a word which had nothing negative. It was simply a label, uh, you know, a label that you would give to this sect, which was actually just one of many sects that coexisted at that time. But it, it gained negative association in English. Uh, Campbell gives some examples uh, also from Korean. Hukstis. Hukstis. Uh, if you can guess what this uh, actually um, is originally in English, you are, you know, like you need you 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 should get a Nobel P a Prize for linguistics. Uh, when I read this chapter in Campbell's book, I was really blown away. Uh, any ideas, by the way? Hextis. I guess no. Yeah, I had no idea what that meant. But then when I read the paragraph, it turns out this is borrowed from English hostess. Uh, but it has a very negative connotation. I happen to know two Korean um, guys who uh, work for a part time for an IT company here in Serbia. They are based in Korea. Uh, their English is very good. Uh, and I asked them if this is true. and uh, Thanks to their feedback, I included this photo. This is what they have in mind when they hear the word hukstis. These are, you know, um, uh, let's say ladies who work at nightclubs and serve male customers. These are like uh, almost like strippers. Uh, and this is another example of negative evaluation. Uh, so. These are the reasons for borrowing. Now, there's another part of the story, and that's what happens when a word gets borrowed. And of course, as you know, again, from courses that you had so far at this faculty, 
the word needs to be adapted. Uh, so the borrowed word undergoes adaptation. Uh, so it's remodeled to fit the phonology and morphology of the borrowing language. So this is adaptation. So foreign sounds are usually changed to, confer, for, uh, to conform to native sounds. Or if there are no native sounds that are really uh, you know, very similar, you have what we call phoneme substitution. You choose the closest equivalent. Uh, and that, that means that foreign sounds which do not exist get replaced by this, uh, you know, what the language system deems to be the closest phonetic equivalent. Uh, one of the best examples comes from Finnish, again. Uh, Finnish originally in the old days, uh, that's like five or six hundred years ago, believe it or not, had no voiced plosives, no voiced stops. So uh, in Finnish, there was no b, d, and g. But as you know from examples which I gave you, Finnish really, really liked to borrow from Germanic and Baltic languages. So what, what do you think happened? Uh, with B and G, uh, since they didn't have them. Uh, so instead of voiced, they chose voiceless stops. So every B and G uh, behaved uh, in the borrowings as if, you know, this was some sort of uh, first consonant shift. So every B and G became P and K because they are the closest phonetic counterparts. So uh, Germanic word bardas, meaning beard, became not bardas, but partas, oh, sorry, parta. Uh, then a Germanic uh, and similar to also English word gas became kasu. Uh, but this pattern exists everywhere. You don't have to look at Indo-European languages. You can look anywhere throughout the world at all languages. And there's this same pattern that you have to adapt to what you have. And uh, one of the examples provided by Campbell, this is all based on Campbell's book, is Sayula Popoluca. It's a language spoken in southern Mexico, and it's interesting because it has no liquids, uh, or maybe it's better to say originally it had no liquids. You'll see later in some other examples what happened. But originally it had no L and no R sounds. Uh, so when Sayula Popoluca borrowed words with L and R, they were replaced with something that it considered the closest equivalent, and that was deemed to be n. So Spanish word uh, cruz, which means, I guess, the cross, became not, it didn't contain r when it was borrowed, it became cunus. That's the cross in Sayula Popoluca. Spanish mula, which we also have in Serbian, mula or mule in English, became not mule, not mul, mul or something. It became moon, uh, sorry, muna, muna. Uh, and the same t happened to uh, plato, uh, which became punatu, plate or dish. Uh, there are other examples of this that, again, come from Finnish. Finnish is really extreme in these cases, and it provides some really, really good examples of adaptation. Uh, so uh, Finnish uh, originally did not tolerate initial consonant clusters. For example, like Japanese only has vowels at the end, sayonara, harakiri. Every word in Japanese ends in a, a vowel. In uh, Finnish, every word, if it begins in a consonant, has to begin in a single consonant. At least that was the original case. You'll see again later what happened. So there were no initial consonant clusters. But we know, again, from Germanic and Baltic languages that they were borrowing, there were many words with consonant clusters. So what Finnish did in order to adapt these words to its phonological rules is that they uh, Finnish eliminated those consonant clusters. 
So uh, the Swedish word uh, franska, which is, guess, you know, you can guess this is French. Uh, this is France, sorry, France. Uh, in uh, in um, that it, that's what it means in Swedish. That's the country, France. Can you guess what happened? What it sounds like in uh, Finnish because they do not tolerate the cluster. Do you think it's Fanska or it's Ranska? Fanska. They probably preserved the, the initial F. That's what you would think and that's what I thought originally, but they are really brutal. They actually deleted the first consonant and uh, or the, the, the word is actually Ranska. So uh, one of the let's say the most important sounds is deleted because phonological rules in Finnish preserved the second consonant in the cluster. Another uh, famous example comes from Russian, so they didn't borrow only Kony, which is, you know, the terrible horse. They sometimes, from Finnish, in Finnish, they borrowed some words with a positive connotation from uh, old Russian in particular. The word uh, risti. Can you guess what it is? Of course, it's in old Russian, kristi, cross, uh, krst in Serbian. And another a good example of this same uh, is uh, the same pattern is the Swedish word skruv, which uh, has nothing to do with sexual connotation. It's actually the you know metal um, metal instrument for joining two objects. So it's a screw, uh, which became ruvi in Finnish. So no s, no k. Only the last consonant, the cluster, was retained. So it was very systematic what was happening. Whenever you had a cluster, you only retained the last word, even if the last sound, even if the first sound was probably the most important, like Franska and Skruv, you ended up with Ruvi. So that's actually what happens with adaptation. But sometimes the opposite happens. Uh, you do not you you borrow so much that you stop adapting and you start borrowing new sounds that's the opposite of adaptation so this usually happens when uh you are in contact your language is in contact with another language and there's a constant influx of new words and at one point you get bored and because you're probably bilingual, you start using the sounds that you use in that other language, although they are not originally in your language. So you actually create new sounds in your native language's phonological inventory. So this is called direct phonological diffusion. So you actually introduce, you borrow new phonemes and you change the whole phonemic inventory. English is one of the best examples for this. English borrowed uh, or actually introduced um, several new phonemes because of the borrowings from Latin and French. So English, for example, had no phonemic Z. Uh, there were some allophones occasionally, but uh, Z became phonemic. It became it, a real phoneme, not just an allophone because of French loans such as rouge. Uh, so these uh, words like this gave, a, uh, gave rise to uh, je becoming a phoneme. Again, you see, because of the contact with the French language. Uh, English also had no allophonic, um, it had no phonemic v, sorry. So it had, for, uh, it had no phonemic v, it only had allophonic v. So depending on where the sound was used, you either pronounced it as f, uh, if it was in, uh, let's say, at the beginning of the word, in a cluster, or if you pronounced it as v when it was in the intervocalic position. This is very similar to what you have in uh, German, actually. So 
uh, the was only, uh, it was actually the allophone of th when th was in the intervocalic position. You still have a remnant of this in what we now consider irregular forms for plural. So, for example, leaf, leaves, wife, wives, wolf, wolves. That was actually uh, the regular pattern from Old English when th is in the intervocalic position, not at the end of the word, it becomes v. So that was the original pattern. But because, again, of the contact with French, where um, initial v existed in words such as vrai, which is what gave us very in English, the became a separate phoneme and it was no longer an allophone of th. So this is the opposite of adaptation. It's direct phonological diffusion, or you can say borrowing of phonemes. Uh, but you cannot, uh, sometimes instead of borrowing just phonemes, you can borrow whole phonological patterns. So uh, you can actually change the phonotactics, you can change the syllable structure uh, through borrowing. Uh, and I told you when I was talking about Finnish that uh, originally there were no initial consonant clusters. So you could not pronounce something like Franska, uh, you only could pronounce something like Ranska. So there was no way to have an initial consonant cluster. But as they were constantly borrowing from Swedish, from Germanic languages, Baltic languages, where there are many initial consonant clusters, uh, after several centuries, Finnish phonology suddenly changed and it allowed these loans to have clusters in the initial position. And uh, that way, for example, you can also now in Finnish, you can find out when the word was borrowed. If there is no consonant cluster, it was borrowed in the early periods of the development of the Finnish language. If there is an initial cluster, it was borrowed more recently over the last, let's say, 200 years. And that's why, for example, the word crocotili has the cluster. If it had it been borrowed, uh, let's say, 500 years ago, it would have been rocotili, but it's now crocotili. Uh, the same applies to a word which you, th you, wouldn't, you would have thought was borrowed a long time ago, but it was borrowed recently. So krunu is the word. It, in the old days, it would have been rendered as runu, but it's actually the crown. And some new ones like presidenti, uh, which in the old days would have been borrowed as resi uh, residenti. And uh, the word which we also have in um, Serbian from Swed Swedish smaragd, we have smaragdi in Finnish. And this way, for example, if you are interested in etymological changes, tracing the development and contact of languages and analyzing the hidden history encoded in words, you can simply follow this pattern and immediately know when the word was borrowed. So if it's an older loan, you have substitution and adaptation. If it's a new loan, you acquire the new patterns. And again, this is not just in Finnish. This is a universal pattern. Remember that Sayula Popolucas that's used in Mex Mexico or Mexico. Uh, so you remember that it originally uh, replaced R with N. Uh, but in new words, there's no substitution by N. So, uh, for example, the word Toro became Turu. In older words, R was always replaced by N. The similar uh, patterns uh, exist. Um, in all languages. So in early days, n was used instead of r and l. Now r and l are separate phonemes and they change the phonemic inventory of Sayula Popoluka. Uh, similar um, 
things can be noticed in, for example, Tzotzi, a Mayan language. In the old days, there were no initial consonant clusters. So Pulatu was the form of Plato. So you see that this U was introduced, so it uh, became Pulatu. But after long contact with Spanish, consonant clusters became allowed. So a new borrowing from Spanish is Plato. So it allows initial consonant uh, clusters. So this is another example of what happens in borrowings. Uh, so uh, what's really interesting is that something that we mentioned but didn't explicitly say that loans are generally based on pronunciation. We uh, borrow words the way we hear them. So it's based on pronunciation. And uh, another famous example, so you remember this hukstis uh, from Korean. Can you guess what Finnish meika a is? Meika ka, um, sorry, make. Huh? Yeah? Made. Uh, yeah, there's something with made or make, but there's another part. Makeup. Makeup. Makeup ka is actually makeup, believe it or not. It's English makeup. So it also tells you, you know, how people hear <laughs> uh, things from other languages. So this really doesn't sound like makeup. Uh, but very rarely, very, very rarely, and Finnish is another example of this. Finnish is really an interesting language to study borrowings. Another language these days is Serbian, but for example, also Albanian is an interesting language and the Basque, uh, the language of uh, the Basque region. They're all interested in terms of borrowings. So uh, sometimes, very rarely, orthography is used, but that's very rare. So the Finnish word for a Jeep is jepi, not Jeep, like in Serbian, where it's also based on pronunciation. In Finnish, it's jepi because that's how you spell Jeep. So, uh, that, of course, uh, is telling you that they didn't have a lot of knowledge about English spelling and uh, how it's pronounced. Uh, by the way, as you noticed, virtually all borrowings in Finnish get this E at the end. That's something that is peculiar to Finnish. So many loans undergo special processes, and usually uh, one of those processes is this E that's added at the end. So you can have uh, adaptation, phonological, or you can have phonological borrowing and you mess up your uh, phonological or even phonotactic system. Sometimes adaptation is not phonological. Sometimes, if not in all languages, adaptation is morphological. So uh, here you have to go and look to the east at the Arabic as a language, which has uh, very peculiar morphological patterns and paradigms. So if you um, if you know a little bit about history, you know that Arabic borrowed um, from Spanish and French because of what was happening historically. Uh, but those French and Spanish borrowings um, were made to fit Arabic phonological paradigms. In Arabic, uh, you probably know this, but I will repeat it. Uh, you know this from the first year course in the you know, general linguistics, uh, in Arabic, the alterations in the vowel, in the root vowel, sorry, uh, so not just any vowel, in the root vowel and the root vowels, if you have more than them, more of them, they actually signal what you normally express with morphemes in Indo-European languages. So the difference between singular and plural is not the suffix, it's actually the alteration of the vowels. Uh, I actually have this here in the slide. So, for example, this is also how you um, form uh, new words. So, uh, word formation is based again on alterations in the root. So, 
the word kataba uh, means uh, he wrote and the pattern is a uh, a uh, a uh. but if you have a uh, long a uh, and e it becomes katib which is a writer so the pattern is a uh, e if you have the pattern e a uh, a uh, it becomes uh, something like uh, kitaba uh, which means uh, the act of writing but if you want to have uh, a noun the pattern is uh, i think e and a which is kitab you know that probably from some historic novels kitab is a book but then uh, in order to make it plural you change it i think to u uh, yes it's kutub that means books and uh if you have another pattern and that's u e a uh, it's uh, something like kutiba that means he was caused to write that's causative passive something that we don't really have in english or uh, serbian but that's a construction which is a verbal construction of causative passive so uh when um Spanish and French words were borrowed into Arabic. They underwent this morphological adaptation. So they didn't retain them in their original forms in singular and plural. So uh, you, they actually applied their original Arabic morphological patterns for singular and plural. So, for example, uh, you have Spanish recibo, which is receipt. And then in plural, it follows the same pattern that I showed you earlier. It's ruaseb. Uh, Spanish vapor, vapor became babor in singular, and then again buaber in plural. So you constantly apply the same morphological pattern. So sometimes adaptation is not phonological sometimes it's morphological and uh, there's a special sub chapter a whole section in campbell's book on how you identify loan words and how you determine the direction of borrowing well we are most of us are native speakers of serbian we know this from our own let's say linguistic experience that you sense that something is foreign because you know it sounds foreign but if you look at it from a big perspective i will just run you from through some slides this is how you do it you know when you look at the big picture uh, and the most important criterion to determine that something is a borrowing is the phonological criterion or criteria so you look at phonological patterns if you have words which violate the phonological pattern of your language like for example in finnish originally no initial consonant clusters then the word is probably a borrowed word uh, and uh, you also uh, look at phonological history uh, you can look at what was happening and you can use these changes in the phonological history to determine the direction of borrowing another way is to look at morphology so if the form is morphologically or etymologically uh, complex that's a word in the donor language if the form is monomorphemic you don't see its internal structure you cannot analyze it morphologically that then it's a loan word like for example for most serbian sp uh, speakers printer is completely monomorphemic they don't understand that this is print plus er the same way they don't understand that computer is not monomorphemic that it's actually compute plus er which gives you computer uh, so that proves when you ask you know ordinary serbian speakers uh, they would say printer is a single monomorphemic word but it's not so it proves that it's borrowed from uh english at least in serbian uh a good example of that and a funny example again listed by campbell is the word alligator alligator in english is monomorphemic 
but actually if you speak spanish you know that it's actually el lagarto that means the alligator so it's determiner plus noun but as you know borrowing is based on pronunciation so what happened is that they borrowed the phrase actually so it, the direction of borrowing was from spanish to english alligator is actually the alligator a uh, similar thing in english happened with the word vinegar which comes from french compound of vin which is wine and agra i think sour so again it had to be from um uh, so the direction was from French to English. It could have been from English to French. Uh, artwork was borrowed from Afrikaans, uh, a variety of the Germanic languages, uh, a new one, by the way, in the Germanic family. Uh, so it was composed from art, which is earth, and work, which is pig. Uh, and there are many many other examples so many arabic loans in spanish include what was like this alligator el lagato uh, so this uh, the, the the same thing happened in spanish they were borrowing a arabic definite article so uh uh so in spanish you have albanil i guess but arabic it's just bana uh, Arabic barkuk is actually albarikukok, whatever, apricot. And you have constantly, you know, words in um, Spanish that retain the definite article al treated as a, as a part of the word, but it was all originally just the article. And there are many examples from history like in sanskrit kana was one eyed but uh actually in proto dravidian uh, we think that a ah, was a negative suffix so kana originally meant i minus without one i and another way that you can guess uh you know where the, the borrowing was coming from was to look at cognate words so words uh that exist or do not exist in uh languages that uh, are closely related sister and brother languages so um the donor language is the one where the word has cognates in its sister languages so the famous examples are again finnish titar daughter which uh, really doesn't exist in uh, Ugrofinic or Finno Ugric family. So uh, if you speak Hungarian, I think the word is pronounced as Lany. Uh, so uh, that's not what we have in Finnish. So obviously, this was borrowed into Finnish from uh, Indo European languages. Uh, and in Indo European languages, of course, you can see uh, the same pattern of Tochter, Tigater, and so on. Uh, the Spanish goose uh, is actually ganso, but that was not uh, borrowed from a Romance languages. It's not a Romance word. It was borrowed from Germanic languages uh, because in other Romance languages, there are no true cognates. So in Latin, it's answer, in Italian, oca, French, oi, uh, and in Germanic, it was gans so obviously here it was borrowed from germanic and there are many similar examples where histories of uh you know where you, but just by looking at uh borrowings you can see um you can see that something is uh you know coming from one direction and there are just two additional ways that you can guess that something is borrowing so one is geographical and ecological cues so zebra doesn't exist in europe so it was borrowed through french from congo languages gnu impala artwork they were all borrowed from the languages where the the animal was originally uh you know uh discovered and sometimes the semantic domain is a cue is a clue sorry so squaw uh, papoose, powwow, tomahawk, uh, wikiap, uh, which is a way, which is uh, in, uh, a place where you live, 
like not like a tent it's wiki up you see it in the last photo uh so these are all you know examples that this was borrowed from native american languages because it describes native american life and culture so the last topic is what can be borrowed and as i mentioned you can borrow and as we proved you can borrow words but you can borrow sounds you can bo bo borrow phonological features what you can also borrow what we didn't really uh, discuss uh, are uh, morphology and syntactic constructions uh, you can borrow fundamentally anything you just need enough time you need appropriate context situations and you will borrow everything so for example uh, these days they say that there are pragmatic borrowings since we are you know at the scientific institution you will not uh, find it you know offensive that i use offensive words but there is a huge study on the borrowings from english into norwegian uh, and th those are pragmatic borrowings so words such as fuck and shit are borrowed in uh into norwegian but uh, actually as pragmatic borrowings you use them as interjections when you uh you know want to express your disgust or uh instead of saying something like yebiga in serbian so uh those words are pragmatic borrowings in norwegian uh, and for example in serbian uh we had an interjection that was borrowed from english we didn't have it uh, 15 years ago wow wow did not exist so that's not considered um really uh a lexical borrowing i mean it is a word but you didn't borrow just a word which is used to denote a certain concept this is a word which has a pragmatic function so wow as an interjection is an example of you know more than just lexical borrowing they, they call it these days pragmatic borrowings and there are many articles being written on it and for example these days you have a completely new way of borrowings in written language so lol lol uh, and similar words uh, sorry acronyms are borrowed in text messages in order to denote laughing out loud laughing on the floor laughing what the fuck etc this is all taken into serbian but this is a completely new way of borrowing so the borrowing itself is changing these days because of also changes in communication so fundamentally everything everything can be borrowed from uh lexicon to phonology to morphology to pragmatics and uh everything in between so there's absolutely nothing that cannot be borrowed uh so phonological rules i mentioned and uh sometimes what you borrow and you know this from um courses that deal with word formation what you borrow is not a word you borrow semantics you borrow the meaning uh, so calcs are actually considered in some cases to be borrowings but not borrowings of words but borrowings of uh, the meanings of lexical items so they are actually a uh, loan translation so calcs are loan translation so uh, black market in um, english is german schwarzmarket uh in serbian for some reason it's not black but it's gray sivo tržište but uh we in a way borrowed the same uh meaning also in serbian uh also uh, for example in um many languages railway which means iron road or iron way was borrowed as a loan translation so in finnish it's uh 
Rao Tatije, which is Rao is Iron, Tia is Road, French, uh, Chemi de Fer, I guess, uh, Road of Iron. Eisenbahn in German is exactly the translation of English, Iron Road, Eisenbahn. Spanish, Ferro Carilli is Iron Way, Swedish, Jernweg is Iron Road, uh, and um, English, uh, also, English is now in the position to be the source for calc. So other languages translate English new words through calc, so like railway, black market, and you'll see some other examples. But in the old days, English was actually getting its vocabulary through calcs, and this usually happened from Latin. So the word almighty, you cannot imagine anything more Anglo-Saxon than God almighty. It, the word existed on, in Old English, so more than 1,600 years ago. It was el michti. Uh, but that's actually a literal translation of Latin omnipotence. Omni is all, potence is powerful. So. Almighty was actually original in Old English a calc because Old English scribes who were translating gospels needed a word and they really just made a new calc translation. Gospel is the same one. You don't think of it as a calc, but gospel is Old English God spell. Uh, God spell which means originally nothing to do with God. God was just good. So good and spell was news. So gospel is good tidings, good news. And if you speak Latin or Greek, you know that this is original meaning from Latin and Greek. Evangelium uh, comes from Greek eu agelion, which means good news, good messages, good tidings. But this time in the 21st century and late 20th century, the roles were reversed, and virtually all languages in the world are taking calx, basis for calx from English. So there's almost no language in the world that doesn't have skyscraper translated as a calc. So German has Volkenkretze, which means something that scratches the clouds. French has the same thing. Spanish has the same thing. And of course, in Serbian and in most Slavic languages, we also have the same pattern. In Serbian, uh, of course, we say soliter. But if you speak Croatian, you know that there is also oblako there. Uh, which is, you know, what you would probably not use in Serbian, but I was born in Croatia, so for me, and I lived in Croatia until I was 15, so my native tongue is actually, in a way, Croatian. I forgot it a lot, but still, you know, uh, when my daughter goes to school and she says that she's analyzing a nema mapa, nema mapa, for me, in Croatian, it's sljepa mapa. I, I didn't know what nema mapa was. Uh, so... Uh, so in Croatian, it's oblako there, and this also have, um, you see, in Romance languages, it's usually verb plus n structure, uh, but in Slavic, it's uh, nv structure, oblako there. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, we mentioned borrowings of, different, of everything, including the meaning and translation. Uh, but what we didn't mention is one last thing, which is also mentioned in uh, Campbell, and that's emphatic foreignization. It's on the borderline of borrowing and simply wanting to be posh and trendy or something like that. Uh, so um, in news media pronunciations, you can hear Azerbaijan and Beijing pronounced exactly uh, as Beijing and Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, originally it was J, it was pronounced as uh, Beijing and Azerbaijan with penultimate stress also. You have something similar happening in Serbian with pyjama and pyjama. 
pyjama, I guess, sounds better because somehow it sounds French, although it's actually English, but okay, let's forget about it. Uh, so, uh, and similar things happen with palm frit and palm free because they think Serbian speakers generally think that t is should not be pronounced like in pejo, right? You don't say pejot. So some people say palm free because you know you don't pronounce the final t. Uh, so, but that's that's actually something that's open for discussion. Nobody knows whether this is an example of borrowing or it's simply you know you want to sound very educated uh so as a summary can we uh, could we connect that to hypercorrection yes yes that's actually related to hypercorrection they think that this is how it should be pronounced but if this depends a lot on the language for example uh, you know that in some language there's no transcription and no adaptation and you are supposed to pronounce the toponyms the way they are pronounced in the original language. So, for example, that's the reason that in Croatian you have uh, Washington, uh, not Washington. Uh, so uh, this phenomenon is not equally represented in all languages and it depends also on the general rules in each language how you treat uh loan words and foreign words especially these are actually toponyms so uh yeah but it actually in many cases it's hyper correction and usually because it's hyper correction it's wrong uh very good point thank you uh so as a summary what can you get in uh, you know as topics for your written exam you can be asked about the reasons of borrowing and the main reasons for borrowing are need like automobile prestige like pork or negative evaluation like coni in uh, in uh, finnish adaptation can be phonological or morphological where morphological is exemplified by the Arabic patterns uh, in uh, Spanish and uh, French borrowings. Phonological can be seen in virtually all languages. Acquisition leads to new sounds. Uh, so, uh, j and v in English, or new phonological patterns like friend, uh, Finnish and Satua Popoluka that allows uh you know that now allow initial consonant clusters uh what you can use to guess that something is a loan morphological complexity so if it's a single word for you it's probably a loan word if it has internal structure then it's not a loan word uh cognates does it exist in your uh, brother and sister languages or it doesn't uh geographical and ecological cues do we have zebras in europe we don't and semantic field like tomahawk and similar in native american words and what can be borrowed everything so not only words but sounds features phonological rules meaning uh pragmatic patterns etc and here i have some examples from the final uh written exam so uh, four years ago, with that same uh, exam that I showed at the beginning, the eighth question was, what are the main reasons for borrowing? Provide an example for each. You would say need, prestige, a negative evaluation. You can mention automobile, coffee uh, for need. Uh, prestige can be uh, pork and, of course, um, or stage in Serbian. Uh, and for uh, negative evaluation, I guess Kony is the best example. Uh, what can be borrowed? Uh, then you say, uh, in addition to words which are typically borrowed, or lexical items, uh, you can borrow sounds, phonological rules, and meanings. And then you give an example for uh this is actually this was evil in 2019 this was you know it required more room than was necessary but you have to mention for example f and v and 
Uh, you have to mention the constant clusters, for example, from Finnish and meanings like calx. And if you are really into that, you can mention these things that I told you, like interjections and phonological uh, features, like how you use shit and fuck in Norwegian uh, or lol in uh, Serbian uh, text messages as direct messages on Instagram, for example. Uh, and then another question from September 2018, what are the four clues that something is a loan word? Provide one example for the type of clue of your choosing, not all four. So you can say morphological complexity and you can say what I told you, printer is morphologically non-transparent to Serbian speaker. They don't see it as print plus ER, agentive suffix. Cognates uh, are uh, another clue, geographical and ecological clues, zebras living in Europe, and semantic field, what we discussed with Native American uh, words. So we didn't go as fast as I thought. So maybe we can now make a five minute break and then we do the boring exercises. Do you agree with that? Anything against that? Anybody against that? We agree. You agree. Okay, five minutes. So we uh, rejoin in the same link. I actually made a mess there. I sent you two events with different links, but we always use the same link. Sorry about that. Uh, I just realized this morning. Uh, so uh, we meet here in this same uh, event in five minutes. So, so let's say 7.32 now according to my clock. Uh, I'll mute myself. See you in five. Two.
Hello, I hope you managed to grab a cup of coffee or maybe a little bit of a uh, glass of water or something else. So uh, here are the boring exercises from Campbell's book. So they are focused on, let's say, universal story of borrowing, not necessarily what you know from uh, your general discussion on English and uh, Serbian that you had at your uh, courses. So uh, I will do my best to finish this relatively quickly uh, in order for, uh, you know, it's already quite late and you generally know a lot about borrowing. So there's no need to go into details on this. So uh, here are the exercises. So um, uh, here, uh, in the first exercise from Campbell, you are asked to guess the, the donor language for the following loans in uh, early English and guess the period from which it was borrowed. So what was it borrowed in Germanic period before 600 AC? Uh, Old English period from 600 to 1100? Middle English? from 1100 to 1500 or early modern English from 1500 to 16, uh, 1650. So uh, can you guess where anger came from and what period? Of course, this is based on the general knowledge you have on the history of English, which you gained throughout your studies that you know, in the early days, uh, there were borrowings from Latin and partially Greek, later from French and Scandinavian, then again from French and uh, Latin, primarily Latin, partially Greek, and also from other languages. So any ideas on anger? Does it sound Latin, anybody? Doesn't sound Latin, right? So, um, it, yeah, it's not an easy exercise because it depends on your intuition, but I can tell you, I looked it up in all relevant dictionaries, so anger is actually from Scandinavian, and it was borrowed in the Middle English period, in the 12th century. Uh, so this is the period, uh, so, um, you know, in the uh, Old English period, there were borrowings from Latin, but uh, in the Middle English period, there were borrowings from both French and Scandinavian because uh, England was split into the part which was ruled, ruled by um, William the Bastard. So, of course, the Norman French was spoken there, but in the north, there was still Dane law. Dane law, of course, means the the, uh, can, the part of the country where Danish laws apply. That was the part of the country ruled by Vikings. So the present day Scotland, for example, was part of Dane law. So uh, this influence of Scandinavian Viking, if you want to call it languages, uh, continued into the Middle English period. So it only started in late Old English, but it really became evident in Middle English. So many uh, words which are, let's call them Viking words, Scandinavian words, Old Norse words, actually were borrowed in the early periods of Middle uh, English, so uh, 12th century or late 11th century. Gradual definitely doesn't sound Scandinavian. So anybody's guess on gradual? Oh, Latin. sorry. Yeah, sorry, I showed yes. it. But you were right, Latin. And it was borrowed actually very late in early modern English. You would guess that it was borrowed earlier, but gradual was actually a scientific term. And most of Latin words that were borrowed in early modern English were scientific terms because that was the period when science beca became more powerful in a way than religion. Prince, any ideas? It's not English, by the way. You cannot think of a more 
English thing than a prince and princess, but they are not really English. They are French. And like all French words, they were borrowed. That's a general rule. They were borrowed in Middle English when the French language was the dominant language. Take sounds very Germanic, right? Uh, so it's probably not French. So what could it be? Uh, any ideas? Scandinavian. Take. Scandinavian and again, like all Scandinavian words, fundamentally it was from Middle English. Paper, paper is not English, uh, paper is borrowed. But can you guess based on the fact that you know, uh, even the early versions of the Bible in included some form of let's say not paper but what was considered to be paper back then, it was probably borrowed very early. So I can already tell you that it's from Old English period when uh, Anglo-Saxon tribe became Christian. Uh, Latin. And they, yeah, it was actually from Latin. So paper is from Latin. History is from the same language from which we took it and fundamentally every other language in the world the people who invented history Greek. yes it's from greek but what's really interesting is that it was borrowed very late in early modern english uh, originally those were just tales about uh, old times there was no word history used uh, in this form mm. uh, kill is not english Sounds like German. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't have influence from German, but we did from a Germanic language. So then it's always Scandinavian. So kill is actually Scandinavian. Mile is really weird. Um, that's actually contrary to what you just said, sounds German. Uh, mile is actually Germanic. Uh, in origin, but it was borrowed very early in this thing, Proto-Germanic period, before Old English even separated from, uh, let's say, um, the rest of Germanic languages. And it's based on a mistake. So uh, Latin milia is plural, but it was mistaken for singular in germanic so mile is the original plural of meal uh mealy um, or meal i think in latin uh fur what can you think as an explanation for fur huh French, maybe? Yes, French, because ordinary people couldn't use <laughs> fur. They, they, they used skin or hide, which we still have today. Fur was just a decoration, so it's from French. Everything that is, that is you know, associated with um, highly expensive decorative objects, it's always from French. Egg is not English. Uh, original word for English is oire, aire. So the same thing, the word you have in German today, oya, is the plural for uh, eggs. Egg is actually from a different but Germanic language. Hmm? Scandinavian. Scandinavian, and it's again Middle English, believe it or not. Uh, nobody can explain these things. These are really like some of these words are really basic words. When you look at them, kill, egg, uh, take, uh, and many other that, uh, for example, some that are not listed here. I don't want to help you too much, but skirt, sky, uh, screw, uh, all these words are from Scandinavian. Uh, tile. What do you think about tile? Again, sounds very English, but it's not English. Uh, Latin. Latin, yes. This is what old uh, Anglo-Saxon tribes came into contact with early 
in old English, when they invaded the British house, they saw tiles in Roman uh, baths. So uh, that was borrowed back then when they were amazed by Roman culture. So it was from Latin. Mirror. Not English. I mean, this is all English now, but originally. Really French. <laughs> yes, it is French and therefore Middle English. Now, sugar is also not English. Uh, here, the story is really weird. Uh, if you know, that's that would be great. But if you don't know, no biggie. It also took me some time originally to find it. And then I verified it because a year ago no two years ago i actually got some kind of a teacher copy from for campbell's book before that i had to guess now i know for sure okay so it's actually a arabic ariana you know ariana she translated a book on the history of sugar and you will uh, hear in the uh, read if you read that book in the so i guess it's uh, in the very first chapter that in English, it comes from Arabic, but not directly. It's uh, It came through Romance languages, which took it first. So, and uh, believe it or not, it was borrowed very late in early modern English. Before that, uh, there was no sugar in <laughs> diets of Anglo-Saxon people. Sugar is actually a new development a new drug that's used by uh, people. It is, in a way, drug. It causes addiction, you know. Uh, OK, so window, not originally English. Sounds very English, but it's not. It's actually Scandinavian. And it has a meaning of a wind door, more or less. So it's a door for the wind. Um, cattle. That's not Scandinavian. Cattle. Latin. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's Latin. I mean, it existed before Old English became Old English. We have it in all Germanic languages. But in Germanic languages, it was taken from Latin. So it was a, a Latin loan, but in the early period. So before uh, Old English. So this is this Germanic period before 1600. Fruit. Fruit is not originally English. Fructus Latin. Well, most of it you can ultimately say is Latin. Everything that is French is ultimately Latin. But fruit, based on the period when it was taken, is, uh, we think, French. But originally, as you say, it's Latin. But in Latin, it has a narrower meaning. In Latin, these are produce, generally anything, including, uh, but also things to enjoy. Uh, and finally, a place name, Devon. Huh? That's not any of the previous languages. <laughs> That's from the people who inhabited the British house before Angles and Saxons arrived. Celtic. Some place names in English are actually Celtic place names. Don't worry, the rest of the exercises are, uh, let's say, they don't require that kind of uh, insight into individual words. Uh, and of course, in real life situation in the classroom, I could have, you know, asked you to try to find it uh, with, uh, you know, I could have brought a couple of laptops with o Oxford English Dictionary here. It's impossible to do that although I do actually have 
four, no, five spare laptops, uh, old ones, but functional for dictionaries in particular. Uh, so this one should be easier. Uh, here you have, this is exercise 2.1, and then we'll do 2.2. It identified the donor language for the following loans in modern English. So these are all words which were borrowed after uh, the second half of the 17th century, so 1650 and later. Uh, and here, first, we are looking at words from European languages. So uh, ba uh, ballet, uh, ballet, no, what's, ba no, how do you pronounce this? I'm so tired. Ballet, right? Cooks go over a ballet. My God, I'm so ashamed. Ballet, I guess. Okay, but ballet, cognac, corsage, roulette, sachet, bastion, these are all. Come on. I know that you're tired, but this is obvious, right? French. French, French this is from French, yes. Uh, but the next one, the next group is not French. Armada, alligator, alpaca, barricade, cannibal, canyon, coyote. Sorry? Spanish. Spanish, uh huh. Including those which I mentioned, like alligator, which are not, or which is actually not a single word, but is actually a determiner plus noun. So this is from Spanish. Balcony, broccoli. Casino, ghetto, piano, or opera torso. These are all, of course, from Italian. Italian. But this one is interesting. Dock, leak, pump, reef, smuggle, yacht, bale, landscape, sketch, cookie, dollar, even, scum, and uproar. Some of the Scandinavian ones may be Swedish. Ah, close, 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 but Dutch, actually. Dutch. These are all Dutch words. Uh, they had uh, very good cooperation with uh, English seamen. So many, many words, uh, especially those related to trade, to uh, some weird food and uh of course seafaring are dutch uh then in the second part of this exercise you are asked to identify the donor language for modern english borrowings but from other uh european uh languages uh so those that you had initially are let's say the most common donor languages what you have here are less common donor languages so noodle and poodle that's not uh, so obvious but kindergarten and wunderkind make it completely obvious that this is german german, german. yes and notice that even today you spell kindergarten with a t it's a mistake to spell it with d so it's not kindergarten it's kindergarten uh even if you turn on the spell checker you will see that this is the right pronunciation so it retains its original germanic spelling bagel kosher schlep spiel schlep schmuck hi german ah in a way you're right but that's called but a very special version of uh, germanic language used by Yiddish. Jews, Yiddish, uh -huh, Yiddish. It is a Germanic language. Um, okay, uh, it's not Hebrew. Don't confuse it with Hebrew. This is Yiddish. Uh, fjord, ombudsman, ski, slalom. Now that uh -huh. sounds like uh, Swedish. Uh huh, and in and you're absolutely right. And we don't know which exactly of That's those languages Scandinavian, because uh, Danish, Scan uh, Norwegian, and uh, Swedish are uh, in the old days, especially in the 17th century, they were almost the same language. So in that period, we call it simply Scandinavian. And to this very day, 
Norwegians can understand uh, Danish and Swedish. Swede Swedes have some issues uh, with Danish, but they understand Norwegian very well. Uh, so, yeah, so it's very similar to the situation that you have with Macedonian, for example, uh, as opposed to Serbian um, and Croatian. Uh, the last one, a Parchik, Tsar, Icon. Very few words, but nonetheless, borrowings. Something kind of Russian. Not kind of, but definitely. This was from borrowed from Russian. So these were like secondary, uh, um, secondary sources for borrowing. So most of the borrowings uh, into English came from French, uh, from um, Latin, but that of course we didn't see in this exercise because it was not in this period. But um, French. Uh, of course, Dutch, and the rest of it was not so Spanish, of course, yes, Spanish. Uh, now, in the second uh, big part of this exercise, Campbell would like you to identify the Dorno languages in modern English, but from other languages, non, uh, let's say, European languages, not necessarily not Indo-European, but not languages that are really spoken in what you would now call uh, European Union or neighboring countries of the European Union. So, Avatar, Karma, and Svastika. Where Some do they? Indian. Sorry. Something Indian. Indian. But very old. Uh, this was actually from Sanskrit. This is taken directly from Sanskrit and partially. It was taken after uh, historical linguists became interested in uh, historical documents in Sanskrit and it became fashionable to uh, analyze uh, uh, religions and traditions from uh, Asia. So it was borrowed directly from Sanskrit. Uh, these are from uh, ancient um, Sanskrit uh, holy books. Uh, bandana, jungle, pyjamas, but in Serbian it was borrowed from English. In English it's borrowed from something else. Punch, shampoo, and even thug. That's also from Asia, but not from an old language, but from, let's say, a more recent language, not a holy language, but a very you know, a language with many, many speakers. A big English colony that explains with the tradition of wearing pajamas, shampooing one's hair. Hindi? Hindi, yes, exactly. This is Hindi. Uh, Czech, checkmate and chess. Very few words, but they were not taken from either Sanskrit or Hindi. They are taken from a language where this game was, you know, available from the earliest days, let's say. Okay, I'll help you. This one is not easy. It's for Persian. Persian or Farsi. Uh, it's not quite clear, but let's say Persian. Gazelle, giraffe, harem. Loot, mosque, bazaar, caravan, especially because of mosque, I think it should be obvious. And harem. It's not Turkish. It's Arabic. Uh, gazelle is a weird one here, but that's actually Arabic. Uh, in the second part, we have some other uh, examples. So banana was borrowed from a group of languages, via Portuguese, banjo, boogie-woogie, gorilla, jazz, jukebox, voodoo, zebra. Juke box is actually a new development, but original juke was from these languages, zebra and zombie. 
Mm -hmm. So here we are very politically incorrect. These are literally dozens of different languages, but uh, what you would label them all together is simply African languages. Uh, different African languages. And we will also be very politically incorrect. The second group in this slide also comes from multiple languages, but we will just label them with a single overarching term. So chipmunk, chocolate, maize, moose, potato, skunk, tobacco, toboggan, tomato. If you know the stories of the new world, you know that these are all, especially the plants, are the plants that didn't exist in Europe. They all came from America. So these are American Indian or Native American languages. Some of these words are from uh, South America. Uh, some are from North America. For example, toboggan is really a North American Native uh, American languages. Uh, toboggan is actually not toboggan that we know. Toboggan is like a sled, something you put underneath your butt and then you slide down the mountain. Um, judo, kamikaze, karaoke, kimono, samurai, soy, sushi, tsunami. That, of course, is too easy. That's Japanese. And finally, boomerang kangaroo these are from not, yeah but we don't call it australian aboriginal right. aboriginal languages again we don't use the proper term uh here um so these are generally called aboriginal languages uh so um Campbell has another exercise here, uh, but I will upload the key to this exercise because it assumes that you try to find, um, you know, the original meaning in the dictionaries. So um, this is more something that I think maybe uh, actually it's not the best idea that we do today but maybe it's better that we do it next week on Monday instead of Tuesday because we moved the class because of Susret Kultura and the day of the faculty. But the whole point is to actually identify the original meaning in the donor languages. And uh, then this is a good stepping stone to the discussion on semantic change, how meaning changes. So. Afri uh, so apartheid came from Afrikaans, but uh, we think of it as a word which denotes segregation to whites and non-whites. But uh, and we think of it as a highly racial, uh, you know, discriminatory term. But the original meaning is simply separation, separation in the sense of separate, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, nails and uh, no, nuts and bolts. So it will separate anything, not uh, based on race. Uh, Chinese, chow mein, uh, so uh, American English probably calls it like uh, stir fried noodles with meat and vegetables. Uh, originally means just fried noodles. Whereas Kung Fu means just skill or art it's not necessarily the art of uh, martial art etc so there are many such words but i think we should stop here and then we can do it next week and then think also about whether the meaning was specialized whether it was narrowed whether it widened and what happened to the meaning so uh i will just leave you with one word which i hope you know is not actually english uh robot was taken from czech it's a czech word uh it was coined by an author uh who was writing sci-fi fiction in a way early science fiction uh, so it was uh, somebody, uh, it's also used in Russian. So some people say maybe it's Russian. It has to do with forced labor, rabotat in Russian, of course. 
Uh, so it's somebody who works uh, compulsory. So it's a compulsory, compulsory labor. So it's borrowed from Czech. And the first occurrence we know is from 1922 uh, from a fiction novel. Uh, so uh, let's stop here. Uh, it's past eight. Uh, so um, uh, this we will finish this, but with a discussion on semantic change, uh, which is the next topic. Um, let me then also stop the recording. Uh, uh, wait a second. Great. So. Uh,